Right, thank you for joining me. This is a rerun of a talk that I did for the Corn Local History Group on the 24th of May 2021. And this is a recording so that other people who are not able to attend uh, can access it. Uh, today, I'm going to uh, look at uh, some of the history related to divining, defining crime and also and the philosophy of punishment and some of, and some of the methods. I've titled it um, A Just Measure of Pain because, uh, and that's taken from Michael Ignatieff's book A Just Measure of Pain, the Penitentiary in the Industrial Revolution 1750 to 1850, which is a very good book if you ever want to read it. Uh, by nature, this, uh, this subject is pretty gruesome. Um, I don't want it to be, uh, because it really does concentrate on uh, uh, on some extreme suffering by, by fellow human beings. But I am going to apply a little bit of humour to it, a little bit of gallows humour, otherwise I think the subject would be just so, so over-facing. Right. We have to remember that what is a crime changes from era to era um, and the things that were crimes are no longer crimes and I'm just going to look at a couple of those just to draw out some of some of the issues around the definition of crime so having a physical relationship with someone of the, of, of the same sex um, in the eighth in the 1530s Thomas Cromwell uh, brought in um, the Buggery Act, which which uh, which obviously outlawed by pain of death uh, having uh, having sexual intercourse with with someone of the same sex. Obviously, this was a, this was applied to males, and this went alongside the uh, uh, the dissolution of the monasteries because uh, I think you have to think that Cromwell was trying to. Uh, uh, show that there was uh, a, uh, a social problem uh, and that the monks were corrupt and therefore justifying the, uh, uh, the dissolution of the monasteries, which obviously was very much to do with uh, taking their wealth and giving it to Henry so that he could propagate his, his wars. Um, so, having or performing an, an abortion. Well, this was Abortions, as you know, were illegal till 1967, and only a couple of years ago were still illegal in in in, in Northern Ireland. Uh, you could be hung for, uh, you could be uh, uh, executed for performing an abortion, and uh, or sent to prison for life. And that generally went to, uh, uh, was was the punishment. Well, life imprisonment could be the uh, the punishment until until the act was repealed. Being a witch, well, we all laugh about witchcraft, but in in uh, witchcraft was essentially on the statute book till 1951. The last person to be uh, uh, being tried and find as a witch was uh, uh, was a, was a woman in 19, 1945. So uh, so it's a fair fairly recent witchcraft was was you know was at times punishable by uh, punishable by death and then and then by life in prison and then the sentences gradually reduced as people became less I guess less less superstitious. Blaspheming, well, again, uh, that 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 was illegal. Uh, quite recently, the uh, 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 the blasphemy act was used by Mary Whitehouse uh, to take out a prosecution against gay news and a po uh, uh, and a poem, "The Love That Dare Not Speak Speak Its Name," uh, by uh, by a man called Kirkup. Uh, because she thought it was blasphemous. She lost, she lost the case, but uh, nonetheless, it could still be, uh, it could still be used, the law could still be used until 2008, when it was finally, finally uh, 
uh, abolished. Wearing weasel fur or ermine, that sounds a strange one, doesn't it? But throughout the time, uh, th th throughout the years, we've had what's called the Sumptuary Acts at various times, which banned people from certain social state uh, w w with 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 lack of social status from wearing the clothes of those with socials, uh, social status. So, for instance, you couldn't wear weasel fur or ermine unless you actually were a lord, even if you were a knight in in the middle ages and again this was this was designed to try and keep society in order if you didn't know what what someone's social status was because they could wear any clothes they wanted to then that then that was considered to be difficult for uh, for the authorities so what we're really talking about here is that uh, is that what is considered criminal usually fits in with the social mores of the day it also laws are made by uh, by those with power and are, are often uh, propagated to uh, uh, to keep the relationships uh, social relationships stable and uh, and and to punish those who go above their station or uh, do something that's actually going to adversely affect those in power for instance you know uh, poaching uh, destroying uh, hedges when 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 in the end of the 18th century when people were uh, when the aristocrats were uh, were getting rid of common land and building and uh, uh, planting planting hedges to uh, uh, get rid of the strips system and, pe and people on the land poor people on the land became dis uh, disaffected and uh, and had to move to uh, you know, and had to move to towns being homeless in Scotland I put this one in because it is actually you can be prosecuted for being homeless in England it's still part of the vagrancy act of 1834 but in Scotland that has now been that has now been repealed you cannot be uh, you can be picked up by for begging uh, on English streets, but not in Scotland. So, um, look at let's look just look at some of the methods of punishment that we have. So we've got ritual humiliation. Well, what kind of things uh, can can we talk about here? Well, we can talk about uh, whipping. Uh, um, I'm going to anyway. I'm going to come back to those. Whipping, branding and mutilation, fines and compensation, imprisonment, hard labour and exile and providing a surety and death and any combination of the above. So I'm going to come back and just look at some examples of those. Right, so let's look at ritual humiliation, shall we? Well, this, I don't know if any of you have seen this, this is actually a photograph of something that is in existence. It is a ducking stool and it is in the Minster in Lempster. And it was last used in the 1830s. It was used for gossiping women and trades uh, and dishonest tradesmen, but quite a lot for women. Uh, and uh, the, un the hapless woman who was caught, uh, who was... Uh, uh, gossiping or, or, or scolding her husband was paraded round uh, round the town of Leominster and then uh, ducked in in the river. It wasn't designed to do anything more than to point her out and give her a, nas a, a nasty wet uh, wet experience. Uh, nothing to do with ducking witches or, uh, or or punishing people by ducking, tying them, tying their. Uh, uh, thumb to their forefinger uh, their thumb to their big toe and uh, and if they sank they were innocent but if they floated they uh, they were guilty so you lost out anyway another example of a patriarchal society scolding women and this is the brank or the skulls bible which was still well, last used in the 1860s uh, and here we have uh, the pillory which uh, was uh, like the stocks but obviously held the, ha the head and, and the hands in fact in the English uh, Civil War it was used as a, a, a as a sentence of death I presume uh, people threw stones stoned stone the, uh, the hapless uh, person confined in there um, and in and here in Corn, our very own facsimile of our stocks, which again, you know, people were 
uh, confined by their by their feet, couldn't move. People get other people who were uh, if, um, would throw things at them, throw rotten fruit, um, contents of uh, of pot of of, of potties, etc., etc. So not a very nice. So branding and punishment, well, uh, and corporal punishment. Well, we we all know about this. Um, we've seen it in military flogging flogging was used in the army and it was used in the navy uh it sometimes used in uh, uh that people were kind of stripped to the waist including women and 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 whipped around around the town it was designed to uh, uh well in in some cases the military flogging could be within an inch of your life whereas perhaps running around and being flogged around the town was a relatively mild uh albeit unpleasant uh um, uh, punishment obviously combined with a ritual humiliation because you might be half naked and uh, yeah. branding branding's an interesting one because uh, until uh, in the past uh, you were uh, people who could read and write were able to claim clergy which meant rather than being tried by the civil authorities they were tried by the church now the church was much more lenient and even in the case of uh, some murderers uh, they could get off if they could uh, if they could recite a verse of the bible usually the 51st psalm or or it, it later became if they could just read if they could just read so uh, and they would be branded on the thumb with an m or a t there was a uh, which meant murderer thief and actually there was an f as well which was felon uh, there were um, there were cases where people were branded on the neck but uh, that only lasted for a few years because they found that those people of course couldn't get jobs and uh, because you couldn't cover it up so uh, uh, anyway uh, so again that one that was abandoned so hard labor right here we've got a, a 90 early 19th century prison so where the hard labor is actually weaving uh, you would be at your loom all day long probably be no worse than well it wouldn't be any worse than being a worker doing that uh, uh, doing that in their home although the light obviously would be much much worse here uh, so there was some point to that but there was pointless labor now this is this is the the crank or the where we get the word where, where we get the phrase screw from uh, and and people would be turning this uh, uh, with massive pressure over and over for about for about 10 hours for about 10 hours a day so it's a pretty pretty bad uh, 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 punishment and pointless and it was regarded as punishment of the uh, punishment of, of, of the mind um, you would and usually it was uh, it was adopted along with 18 months of solitary confinement so you didn't see anybody you were confined to yourself you did this all day long if you were allowed out for exercise you wore a hood uh, and it was totally pointless and it was 30 to 61 pound uh, 60 pounds of pressure which which was quite phenomenal really this is the treadmill you'll all have heard of it's like a giant uh, hamster wheel um again on this 10 hours a day uh when it was first introduced it was uh, uh they put old people on it, men with hernias on, pregnant women, and and not surprisingly had had quite a few fatalities. Uh, there is a case in uh, being used in Leicester Prison early on, where in fact three people died within a very short period of time. Um, and the last thing I've chosen is picking oak, and we all know we, we've all heard this. This is something you might have done in a prison or a workhouse. Unpicking rope were a great maritime power, and uh, rope was re was re was recycled. Obviously, it would cause you extreme pain in your fingers to uh, to be doing that all day long, especially at the age of some of those. Okay, let's have a look at. Let's let's have a, let's have a look at, uh, at prisons now. So the various sorts of prisons we have, we've got the debtors' prisons, which I think feature a lot in the 19th century. We don't have them today, uh, and they were uh, um, 
the prisoners were unconfined, generally speaking, if they were in for debt. Uh, some of them could even even pay extra money to, to the jailers to get to, to live within seven miles of the prison or get out for a day. So we've got the fleet, which was described as the greatest brothel in uh, uh, in London. The Marshall Sea, which again, uh, another another famous one, features in Dickens, uh, um, in, 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 in Dickens books. Uh, you were kept at the expense of your uh, of your creditors uh, and you had to try and get enough money to, to be left out. Some people operated businesses from, from there. They were lucky, uh, lived in quite nice accommodation. The health family was there and essentially, essentially there, uh, 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 the person they owed money to was, keep, was keeping them there. Uh, but it cost money to live there and their debts were increasing all the time. So they, they would take them, they, they lived there until they were, they were discharged, which often in many cases would, would, uh, uh, would, would, would be never. Um, so we've got borough or town jails. Well, again, these were, they, 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 these were a mixture of uh, uh, people in borough or town jails would be in for a, a variety of things. There would be debtors, there would be uh, uh, people waiting transfer, uh, waiting trial, uh, serious, well, serious uh, crim, uh, for cr criminal uh, crimes. People serving sentences. Some people would be chained. Others wouldn't be. Obviously, debtors weren't. Uh, we've got, uh, we've also got bridewells, houses of correction, which, which often again were in borough, uh, borough jails or separate institutions in Leicester. It was a separate institution, um, and these go back to Queen Elizabeth's day. And there was an attempt within these houses of correction to uh, uh, present the prisoner with hard work and uh, uh, plain, plain, plain food and try and reform them. Um, so in in many prisons we'd had we'd have debtors we'd have felons awaiting trial we'd have felons serving sentences we'd have the condemned waiting execution we'd have those awaiting transportation so it was a real mishmash uh, and everybody confined under different different rules uh, they were extremely corrupt institutions money. Uh, uh, Money was being channeled, channeled off to uh, uh, those those running the prison to uh, uh, to get rich, while the prisoners often uh, uh, starve. So, looking at prisons, we've got our town lock up in 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 Quorn, really just for the night. Someone's arrested before we can they, they can be put before the magistrate, a bit like a police cell now. The borough jail in Leicester was in High Cross Street, and it was here till the till the eighteen nineties. It was built at the only built a hundred years before, and interestingly enough, the the actual builder of the borough jail, uh, a man called Money Penny, was was one of the first uh, uh, first to be put there for debt. So, um, and one of the famous uh, jailers that we have from. Uh, 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 f from our Bridewell and our and our town jail in Leicester was 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 Daniel Lambert who was uh, who worked there till he got too fat to be able to get around the corridors in which, by which time he was pensioned off. Uh, we also have uh, hulks and you remember the Hulk from uh, Great Expectations, Mag, Mag which is out in uh, Dickens's book, Mag which is uh, is on the prison Hulk. Uh, it's usually those awaiting transportation, and in many cases they were doing hard labour. In fact, most of the docks around London and the Medway were uh, were were rebuilt by by prisoners in 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 Hulk prison hulks. So they were very insanitary, horrible places to be, as were all these jails. And here we have our town jail uh, built in the uh, 1829 by William Parsons. Uh, Clearly, they say it's the, the jail with the highest prison walls in the, in, in the country. It's designed to look like a castle. It's designed to look imposing and to be forbidding and, and for criminals not, uh, and for, uh, try to, for, for people not to commit crimes because they didn't want to enter such a building. So let's have a look at execution. Now, we've got 
various scenes here. We've got a hanging, drawing and quartering. And I won't go into the detail of hanging, drawing and quartering, uh, but you can read up that yourself. It is the most barbaric way of executing someone. But then if you could think of any barbaric way of, uh, of executing someone, we've probably, uh, human beings have tried this. Uh, being burnt, burnt at the stake, often applied for, for heretics, sometimes for trees and women. It was it was used particularly for women, even even until the the uh, the late eighteenth century. Um, although often women were uh, uh, were strangled before they were placed in the in the flames. Uh, here we've got. Uh, um, a processional. This is a, pre, uh, a, a uh, Hogarth print. People uh, being the uh, the the uh, Tyburn procession. People were paraded through the streets, stopped off at a pub. Uh, the, the criminals were stopped off at the pub, were given given a drink. There were soldiers. There were could be twenty thousand people in attendance. There was uh, people picking pockets. Uh, while watching pit pockets being hung, so it really did show you that maybe it wasn't wasn't a great. So what methods do we use in Britain? Well, hanging is our it, it, it is, is is has been our most common one. Beheading was used for the nobility, and we all know about Henry VIII chopping the head off uh, uh, his wives. Uh, his uh, Anne Boleyn was was uh, was executed by a French a French executioner with a sword he was incredibly skilled and brought over from france for just for the job hanging drawing and quartering which is bit was on the statute books until 1820 even though i said i will not talk about it uh, you were drawn you were drawn to the uh, drawn to the place of execution you were half hung your inside your uh, basically ripped ripped out while you were still alive you were castrated if you were uh, you were castrated your uh, your entrails and your uh, and your testicles were burnt and then you were uh, chopped into uh, chopped into quarters and your bits often sent round the realm and displayed on spikes on bridges or or buildings horrible and burning the last execution was Catherine Mur uh, Murphy, who was a counterfeiter, but a counterfeit, which you'd think, well, now that's not a particularly uh, uh, um, bad crime, but clearly doing those uh, 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 counterfeiting was, was, was one of the many of the 220 odd acts that were in the bloody, were in the part of the bloody code that you could be hung. So hanging, let's look at hanging because it is our kind of favoured way of execution. Thought to have begun in Persia two and a half thousand years ago. Um, it was brought a bit in the, by the Saxons. And interestingly enough, the Saxon for gallows is Gagla, which is where we get our gala days for. So uh, our corn, corn gala would, would have been a... Um, in re reality, would have been where where where, the, where criminals were hung. You don't need skilled executioners. Clearly, you do now, or you do, you do because there is a science to hanging. But uh, uh, you can be it's 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 somewhat easier to to get the re required result um, um, with uh, <coughs> than it is for, for for people to chop heads off. It's not excessively cruel, well, that's like arguably, isn't it? But it, but it, but it doesn't appear to be in the same way as hanging, drawing, and quartering is. Uh, you can carry it out anywhere. You can hang someone from a tree. You don't need much equipment, you, and it's not too messy. Think about it in terms of chopping heads off. Well, there's, uh, there really isn't any blood, and it's a highly visible deterrent. You know, and that's what uh, part of what for. So I'm going to look at five cases uh, or five events that happened in Leicestershire over well over over a thousand years which actually have an, have national significance. And these are the greatest number of hangings on one day that are recorded. 
uh, Leicestershire's Peaky Blinders, who uh, perhaps inspired the Robin Hood story, and we'll talk more about them. Uh, this, these were a gang of aristocrats who uh, um, who were like something out a Game of Thrones or Peaky Blinders. The last peer of the realm to be hanged in public. The last execution of, of Luddites in. Uh, and the last man to be gibbeted, and I'll explain that. So let's have a look. So greatest number of hangings in one day. This is a picture of Croft Hill. Croft Hill, which is in South Leicestershire, near Huncut, uh, was uh, 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 the meeting place of the hundreds, uh, 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 the, one, of, one of the hundreds, um, and uh, uh, was, was a meeting place that, that well, in, in in Saxon times and things like that. So, in 12, uh, in 1124, in the reign of Henry the uh, First, and it was a site saying it was in the hundred at Spark and Hope. Uh, the Earl of Thatcourt hung. 44 people described as thieves, and they were hung, and six were six were also blinded and castrated. The Felville Gang. Now these are the Peaky Blinders, right? So John Felville. Uh, lived in Ashby Folville, he was a respected knight, and when he died, his son inherited. Now, he had six remaining sons, and obviously later on in the, in, in the time, these, uh, these lads would have gone into the church, the army, or the civil service, but they decided, clearly none of those, well, apart from the army, none of those options were really, really open to them. So they decided to become an awful, uh, uh, an organised crime group. So their first big, uh, big act was the assassinate a rival of theirs, Sir Roger Bella, who's, who, is, who is unpopular with the population. He's a powerful figure and they kill him on the Melton, Melton and Leicester Road. And this becomes part of their sort of notoriety for getting rid of people who are not particularly well liked who are also thought as corrupt however they are tracked down they face they will face execution if they're found so they go off to france and work as mercenaries and this is always a way certainly in the middle ages where uh, 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 where young men with the talent for fighting can go and work for uh, can go and work as a mercenary for a king, a queen, or a prince, and uh, rehabilitate themselves. So they come back, and uh, Edward the Second is be is fighting a war with his wife Isabella and uh, the uh, uh, the martial lord, the chief martial lord Mortimer and uh, they fight for Isabella and Mortimer. Uh, even while they're doing that, they steal, they steal from, from Leicester. They, they, they sack it and steal 200 pounds. Clearly they've been stealing, ro robbing as, 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 as well all, all, all the time. So they continue to cause chaos in Leicestershire. So even though they're fighting for what you know, see, could be seen as a legitimate cause, they're still, they're still feathering their own nests. Uh, in 1332, uh, they've been, you know, they, they've been pardoned by Isabella and Mortimer. Uh, they, they kidnap a Richard Willoughby, another, you know, another unpopular uh, uh, character, and, and ransom him for 1300 marks. So Eustace, who's the who's who's the oldest uh, one of the remaining brothers, retires, and and uh, Richard takes over. He's the second youngest, and he's the vicar, and he is a vicar. He's a vicar of Tay in Rutland, and uh, uh, they're great. Uh, Colville is is there is 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 after them for their for their deeds and Richard is lynched. There there is a basically a shootout with him and his men holding out in the church. I don't know what's happened to the other uh, the other um, Folvilles at this time. I'm not sure they're in the church uh, and uh, he's he's dragged out and and, and beheaded. Now these guys are mentioned in Piers Pl Plowman. Which is Lang uh, uh, Langness Piers Proud and fetching it for false men with Folville's law. So there's an idea that they are they are acting. Uh, what they do is good, 
they are they are killing uh, their law is 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 getting rid of evil men and he actually in Piers Plowman he describes uh, uh, Robin Hood and and uh, our, uh, our the ancestor of the man that build, that builds the church in Quorn, uh, ran off the Earl of Chester as as uh, uh, unfavourably uh, when it when taken against the Folville. So the Folvilles are kind of Rob, uh, are Robin Hood. They are regarded as as as, as people who who rob rob the rich. I'm not sure they give to the poor. And this is a picture of Eustace uh, uh, Folville, who, of course, leaves the gang and goes on to be knighted and uh, uh, have a very, uh, a very satisfying life as a as 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 a gentleman. I'm not sure what happens to the other Folvilles. It's a, another story, I think, really. But Eustace becomes totally rehabilitated. Obviously, he's not involved in the shootout in town. So, and that's the and that's the that was the church in Tay outside of which where uh, um, where he was where Richard was uh, 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 had his head chopped. Right, Earl Ferris, the last peer to be hanged. Now he's got estates in Derbyshire, Northamptonshire, and Leicestershire. Uh, his main residence is Staunton Harold. He's got a mistress and four illegitimate daughters, but he hasn't got an heir. He hasn't got a legitimate heir because he's not married to Margaret Clifford. So he decides to marry a 16 year old called Mary, hoping for an heir. Now clearly his behaviour is, abu is abusive towards her. He's known as a man with a short temper and a vicious man. And she successfully receives a separation by Act of Parliament in, in 1758. Until 1857, you had to get an Act of Parliament to, uh, uh, to dissolve a marriage. Now, you would only get a marriage dissolved if there was excessive cruelty. Uh, by by your husband much easier for men to divorce women of course but it must have been so uh, so bad that that, that that parliament debated it and 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 granted her that not only did they grant her the divorce they awarded her a share of the rents from some of the properties now that's again something quite unusual uh, so they appoint trustees to deal with these rents and John Johnson, who's a family steward, is dealing with it on behalf of, of Mary. Um, however, Earl Ferrers lures him to the house and there's a, a disagreement and he's shot by Earl Ferrers, shot dead. Uh, but he is called to book. He's tried by his peers in Westminster Hall. So the idea is that the only people who can try you uh, in English law are your peers, i.e. the jury. However, this man is a peer, so he can only be tried by other peers of the realm. Uh, he does try and claim that he's, he's, that he's insane. However, uh, there is no, uh, uh, in English law, there isn't no nobody is, is is able to claim that they're insane until the early 19th century when somebody tries to shoot George George III and it is actually proved that he's insane so he gets off the death and uh, the death sentence. However, he tries to petition to be beheaded because he is an aristocrat. However, in in law that's only allowed now for treason and he didn't prove it treason he committed common murder however the the uh, the spectacle is uh, ha has the gallows and the uh, and the platform uh, draped in uh, draped in black there are black horses in fu funeral garb there's a uh, detachment of, uh, of, of of soldiers there great pomp and ceremony now in 18 uh, uh, a couple of years before 
uh, Parliament actually, uh, passes an act that anyone that murdered their body is no longer uh, murdered someone, their body is no longer their own, and they are taken away to either to be gibbeted, which we'll talk about later, or dissected. So there is a carriage there to take Earl Ferris away to be cut up by uh, uh, by surgeons. Right. The last execution of Lud Luddites in 1870. Now, this does have a particular relationship to uh, 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 to, to Loughborough, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit. So, six men were executed outside the bride, the new Bridewell, in 1817. There's a crowd of 1,500. There's local dignitaries, crew puppets, are in attendance. The found so this is what what it was. Uh, uh, what relates to to, uh, uh, to Loughborough. So they found guilty of aiding and abetting the shooting of John Asher, who fired at them first during the attack on the 55 lacing machines at Heathcote and Bowden's Loughborough's factory. They don't kill him, they injure him. They are Thomas Savage, Savage Joshua Mitchell, John Amos, William Towell, John Crowder and William Withers. There is another random person who set fire to, who's also killed there, but he's not a Luddite, he's an arsonist. Uh, the leader, John Tow, uh, who obviously the, the brother of William Tow, was executed in, Not in Nottingham the previous November, and it's claimed that he named those as his men as his accomplices. About 55 were thought to have been involved in total, and the seven were hanged and three times. Now they were, um, uh, we had a talk by Chet, Tony Jerome to the history, the history group a, lot, a, a while ago and it, it, there is a theory that those men were employed by Nottingham lace manufacturers to uh, uh, get the get uh, Heathcote and Bowden's factory to, uh, uh, to be unable to produce uh, lace. So the next man we're going to look at is James Cook. Now he's the last man to be hung in chains in 1832. He's a respected bookbinder in, in Wellington Street. Uh, he's in debt and he's called on by one man who owes money to, who presents him with two bills. This man's called Pars. He pays one bill and then he calls Pars to come back later, uh, um, which Pars does. And then a quarrel ensues and Pars Bars tries to defend himself against the attack, but Cook kills him. He steals sixty pounds and a watch from Pars. Now his behaviour next is really, really odd. So he tries to burn the body. So he cuts the body up. He, oh, he tries to burn it over several days in the in, in the grate. Uh, he goes out bowling and drinking with his mates, uh, and the, when he's trying to burn the last of the evidence, he goes to bed drunk and the, it sets fire to the premises. So, uh, human remains are found, obviously Cook. Cook's not there, he flees to Manchester, Manchester. he goes to Loughborough and then he gets the coach to Loughborough from, to Loughborough from Manchester and then, and, and then to Liverpool. Uh, but they do find that the remains which, uh, of which, uh, uh, Cook originally said were were for his dog uh, were human, uh, and he is caught trying to get on a boat, uh, uh, rowing out to a boat to take him to America. A bit like uh, again, the the Dickens novel Magwitch does the, is doing the same to try and get back to Australia, and is caught. Well, in fact, he drowns, but uh, but. The judge considers it such a heinous crime that he's, hang, he's hanged and he's hung in trains over the co on the corner of Saffron Lane and Aylston Lane, about where uh, uh, the garage is today. Uh, the, the, there's, there's a, there's a, a Hyundai garage there now. There's been various things over the years, Sturgis, I think. <laughs> Spectacle caused a public outcry. 200,000 largely disgusted visit, uh, visitors in the body. So the body is quickly removed by the authorities. Uh, it is actually buried underneath where the, where, where the gibbet was. And But there are great fears because this is the time of the passage of the 1832 Act, uh, Reform Act, which doesn't give working people the vote. It gives the vote to very few middle class people. So uh, uh, many men... Uh, 
who yeah well not women because of course they won't even wouldn't be included in it for a long long time um are, are you know are upset that, uh, that there is no opportunity for them to so he's hung in he's hung in a gibbet and this is a copy of the gibbet and this is you can see that the body is put in this and uh left usually left to uh, tars usually put over the the body it's left there to rot uh the birds pick at it you know it, for it's no doubt it must smell awful uh and the local residents don't want that anymore they feel that belongs to another another age um uh, it was a punishment that was used in the past even uh, somebody like uh robert ask who was uh in the 16th century were led the pilgrimage of grace and 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 an uh, uprising against henry the eighth was was actually hung from the uh, uh, walls of uh, york york castle still alive and he died and, and uh, uh, until he died and then then he was kept it like that for i think his body would have been there for a couple of years Right, so now we're going to look at some uh, some local people, some people who have a connection with corn. Now, John Smith is a high woman. So he's born in 13, 1537. I just describe him as a high woman as this is his crime. He's, mo he's mostly, he's been other things too. He was a tailor. But whether or not he qualified, we don't know. He... he he joins the army like many young men and he's in this sixth regiment of foot uh and he come and he comes back um from america and joins the guard but just before he commits the crime of uh, of highway robbery he uh, he deserts from the guard so he's obviously signed up again in another regiment now we know he had a wife and two small children and he's living in Northamptonshire. So he teams up with Richard Kelly, who again is another war hero, I guess we'd say, a sailor in uh, George III's Navy, served in the Caribbean, both you know, men not unusual because because at this time we've got a lot of uh, a lot of soldiers and sailors who've come back to uh, uh, to Britain uh, with no money and no job. So they stop a John Johnson, another name that's uh, not the same John Johnson that's shot, but obviously shot by uh, Earl Ferris. They stop him on a public highway and they steal a handkerchief, a pocket knife and four old pence, which if you remember is probably about two, what is that, about two and a half, uh, two and a half new pennies. Not a lot, is it? No, I, we assume John Johnson wasn't hurt. It tells us here in the Northampton Mercury on the 4th of August, uh, 8th of August, 1785, that they both acknowledged the justice of their sentence and behaved in very penitent and becoming manner. Great intercession was made to save the lives of these unfortunate men without effect. The, mel the melancholy situation which the, ca uh, the country is in at present from the frequent depredations of every description that are committed having rendered it indispensably necessary that all applications for an extension of the royal mercy should be discountenanced. So they are sentenced to death and there is no repeal of, of that. There is no there is no there is no remission from the king. Um, they're unfortunate because they are condemned to death at a time when transportation is not available. Uh, you can no longer be transported to America because the Americans have won the War of Independence and don't want criminals there. And Australia, although it has been discovered by Europeans, should I say, uh, has not been, has not started to be, it wouldn't start to be used till late, late, later in that decade. So they are hung. I mean, whether or not they feel the sentence is just, I really don't know. It is rather strange sentence what happened to their bodies we don't know we're assuming no one was killed so they wouldn't have been uh, wouldn't have been uh, gibbeted or, or cut up by surgeons their families should have been able to get the you know, the bodies but we don't know a lot about them about them but anyway 
So let's look at Samuel and William Rudkin, both live in Quorn. Uh, these are not pictures of them, but they are they are sheep stealers and other things. So they're a father and son. There's 20 years between them. In August 1828, uh, they're indicted along with another man, George Glover, for sheep stealing at Bow Manor. Mr. Pepper uh, counts his sheep the night before. Next morning, a lot of this, some of the sheep have, have, have wandered off, and he finds them in in what's described as uh, Muckley Wood, which which is that bit of land quite near, quite near to Bow Manor Hall, which is still 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 described. I think as Muckley Wood. Is it? Might, it might be Muxley Wood. It was originally it was in Muckley now, but so there are sheep missing. We don't know how many were missing. We know they found blood, and we know they found uh, and they found footprints. So they held along with Mrs. Rumpkin in, in, uh, after the homes had been searched in a cell. And the end, so the evidence presented at the trial is that various parts of sheep and lambs are found in their house. That's everything from, you know, uh, uh, the sheep's offal, its meat, uh, its meat um, and the fleeces. And the bloody footprints are found um, are found in the meadow, and they match the the, the nails on on the Rudkin's boot, uh, and they're sentenced to death, Leicester Assizes. But it is commuted to transportation, probably at the trial, because judges had the power to do that. If there was no loss of human life, then they could, although sheep stealing is on the statute books. Uh, they can make that decision not to not not to hang them. So they're both held on the prison hulk, like the one I showed you earlier, the Ganymede, and that's in the Medway, and it's at Chatham. Uh, they're separated. William goes on the thirteenth of uh, of July uh, to Australia, and he arrives in Van Diemen's Land, com uh, you know, uh, current day Tasmania. Uh, it just before on the 14th of December 1829 on the Surrey and the Surrey is an interesting boat because that is a boat that carries uh, some of the toll pull and puddle marches to their uh, uh, transportation to, be, you know, to being transported. Um, Samuel, the younger one, departs on the 22nd of May and he arrives in September and he arrives in Sydney. And we know that the records show that he died in uh, on the 20th of April, 1842. Now, normally he would have been sentenced to 14 years and then he'd get his ticket for the uh, ticket to leave. Now, if you notice that he's just short of getting that, it was unlikely he would have ended coming home, but he, he actually would, uh, um, he, he probably would have been free and I can find no record for William at all even though I have adopt, tried adopting him on a, on a adopter convict site uh, in, in, in Australia so it needs to be keep searching for him. So the last person we can deal with is Ruth, Ruth Ellis and if you remember uh, uh, Ruth Ellis born in real in 1926 born in Basingstoke in 1950, she's living in a caravan with her son Anthony on what is now the Warwick Avenue estate, and she's working in Nottingham clubs. She's variously described as a nightclub hostess, a bit part actress, a model and a prostitute. Uh, so in London, she meets, she goes to London, she meets a public school boy, gets it. Into, so he's, you know, been in the, been in the guards. He's a, been to Sandhurst. He's a playboy, racing driver David Blakely. He treats her abusively. Uh, she suffers a miscarriage. He's supposed to have punched her in the stomach. It's clearly an abusive relationship. In spring of that 1955, she's given a revolver by another suitor of hers, a Desmond Cusson, and taught how to fire it. Now we're not sure why exactly. What what Cusson thinks she's going to do with it. Um, and we're in April of 18, uh, 1955, she takes a taxi to the Magdala 
pub in Hampstead and Blakely's outside and she shoots him four times in the street. First one misses, second one uh, gets him, uh, he, so he starts to run away after the, after the first miss. The second one gets him, brings him down, uh, she, she runs up to him with the revolver and shoots him twice while he's on the ground. Um, the judge, who is uh, Justice Havers, uh, Michael Havers' grandfather, told tells the jury to ignore any prover any provocation that she might have had, even though she's a bad woman. She's found guilty and she's sentenced to death by him. Now, she is the last woman to be hanged on the 13th of July 1955, and she's hung by Albert Pierpoint, who is a uh, who, who was the uh, the last hangman of Brit in Britain who was responsible for hanging uh, many Nazis at, uh, at uh, Nuremberg. 50,000 people sign, for, sign a petition for clemency. This does not sit well with the public. People feel that she has been uh, s not given justice. Havers is supposed to have written to the Home Secretary, the son of Lloyd George, asking for mercy for her, but uh, the Home Secretary refuses. And if we look at the pictures of her, there was very much this, she refused to kind of tone down her appearance when she went before the, the judge. The jury saw her as this, as this woman uh, here, and we are talking about 1950s morality where it really wasn't okay to pose the photographs when you're suspended belt. Uh, but, you know, clearly there was, most people think there was a miscarriage of justice. Here point, the man here, the hangman, who, who became a publican later and retired to Southport, uh, um, doesn't say, doesn't say that she, uh, uh, that he didn't think she should hang, but he did. He did say in later years that he thought hanging was just, just, just pointless. He thought it wasn't a deterrent. So, and that is the end of uh, the end. The end of this talk. Thank you for listening.